Hello, and welcome to Exposures to Nanomaterials and Products. My name is Pete Rayner from the University of Minnesota, where I'm an Associate Professor in the School of Public Health. The objectives for this module are that, by the end, learners should be able to classify products based on how nanomaterials have been incorporated, describe how workers may be exposed to nanomaterials and products, identify workers at greater exposure risk, and categorize routes by which the general public may be exposed to nanomaterials and products. In this drawing from Sun and co-authors, we see some of the steps in the life cycle of engineered nanomaterials. The production of raw engineered nanomaterials and the fabrication of nanomaterial-enabled products were discussed in a previous module. In this module, we will consider the risks that people working with nanomaterial-enabled products have of being exposed to engineered nanomaterials as they use or manipulate the products. In addition, we will discuss the risks of worker exposures to engineered nanomaterials in waste streams, especially for materials that are recycled. Exposures derived from the potential releases of nanomaterials to the ambient environment will be covered in a later module. This figure was created by Hansen and co-authors to categorize nanomaterials for health-based studies. The authors separate nanomaterials into three broad categories. Materials that are nanostructured in the bulk, materials that have nanostructure on their surfaces, and materials that contain nanostructured particles. Within the bulk category, they include single-phase nanomaterials such as nanocrystal and copper, which is bulk copper made very strong because it is formed from nano-sized crystals. Bulk nanomaterials also include multi-phase materials like nanoceramics that are porous, allowing the presence of a liquid or gas phase within the solid nanomaterial. Products with nanostructured surfaces include those in which the surface is nanostructured but is the same material as the bulk underneath, as seen in medical and dental implants, those in which an unpatterned film covers a bulk support layer of another material, like anti-fouling and anti-reflection coatings, and those in which a nanostructured film covers a substrate of another material, as seen in read-write heads and lab-on-a-chip systems. Finally, nanoparticles can be used in products in a number of ways. When bound to surfaces, they can serve as catalysts or antibacterial agents. Suspended in liquids, they can be used in medical applications or as sunscreens and cosmetics. Nanoparticles can be incorporated into solids as they are into polymers to make stronger plastics. Nanoparticles are nanoaerosols when airborne. When they are settled as a nanopowder, they are in many ways like a bulk material. In either case, we do not generally consider loose nanoparticles to be an engineered nanomaterial enabled product. This diagram from Harper and co-authors, while created considering carbon nanotubes, can help us think broadly about exposure risks to workers and the public from engineered nanomaterials. Workers can be exposed during the synthesis of engineered nanomaterials and as the nanomaterials are incorporated into ENM-enabled products. As these products are used, perhaps by industrial customers who turn them into consumer products, worker exposures may be derived from the handling of the ENM-enabled products as they are reformed or machined. Eventually, consumers will use products, possibly at work but more often in their personal lives, creating the risk of direct exposures to the consumers or of releases to the environment that could lead to additional exposures. At the end of an ENM-enabled product's useful life, it may be incinerated, get sent to a landfill, enter wastewater, or be recycled, any of which can lead to environmental releases. In addition, recycling has the potential to create exposures for workers in that industry. Much of what we know about worker exposures to ENM-enabled products comes from experimental studies rather than from workplace observations. I would like to share with you a research project that I participated in to investigate the potential for the release of engineered nanoparticles into the air as plastics that contain nanomaterials are recycled. My collaborators in this work were Jessica Sabula, also from the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, Jeff Spangenberger from Argonne National Laboratory, Bernard Olson from the University of Minnesota Department of Mechanical Engineering, and Gene Dash and Jim Darcy from General Motors. 
As you can see, this work was published in 2012 in the Journal of Occupational and Environmental Hygiene. The project was funded by the United States Council for Automotive Research, an industry-supported organization. The motivation for this research was that each year, approximately 15 million automobiles in the United States reach the end of their useful lives. In Europe, this number is 8 to 9 million vehicles. By weight, about 84% of these vehicles are recycled. The plastic parts from these vehicles are often shredded for potential reuse. Automobile manufacturers are increasingly using plastics reinforced with nanomaterials in their vehicles, and these so-called nanocomposites are now being recycled. A composite is made from two or more constituent materials with significantly different physical and or chemical properties. When formed together, the constituents form a material with different physical and or chemical properties from the constituents. Among the most common composite materials are plastics with fill materials added to reinforce and strengthen the polymer. Nanocomposites are composites in which the fill material is a nanomaterial. Benefits of nanocomposite plastics relative to regular composite plastics include possessing equivalent strength for less weight and offering better barrier, flame resistance, and thermal properties without loss of clarity. These advantages have led to the use of nanocomposites in vehicle components and food packaging. The U.S. automobile industry was concerned that the shredding of nanocomposites might release free nanoparticles into the air. Because of the health concerns this poses, we were asked to conduct experiments to try to answer the question, are engineered nanoparticles released into the air when a nanocomposite material used in vehicles is shredded for recycling? We constructed a test apparatus at Argonne National Laboratory in a facility that studies vehicle recycling. A small-scale granulator, a machine capable of shredding plastics, was placed inside a filtered enclosure. Attached to the enclosure was a duct from which we could draw air samples into a variety of instruments capable of measuring particle number, surface area, and mass concentrations, and particle size distributions by number and mass. We shredded small test plaques of three different polypropylene plastics, plain polypropylene resin, polypropylene resin reinforced with 20% talc by weight, which is a conventional composite plastic, and the nanocomposite, polypropylene resin reinforced by 5% by weight Montmorillonite nanoclay. These test plaques were fed into the granulator at a rate of four per minute for two hours for each of the plastics. This is the diagram of our apparatus. The air was pulled into the enclosure containing the granulator through a HEPA filter by a fan unit. A pair of gloves, like those used in glove boxes, was inserted into the enclosure to allow the test plaques to be picked up and placed into the granulator. We were able to measure the temperature and relative humidity inside the enclosure using an instrument called a Q-Track. The air was drawn from the enclosure through our test duct at a rate of 190 cubic feet per minute or 320 cubic meters per hour. We sampled the air from the duct at two locations using a variety of aerosol instruments. These instruments included a P-Track ultrafine particle counter that measures number concentrations for particles with diameters ranging from about 20 nanometers up to about 1 micrometer or 1,000 nanometers. We used a Fast Mobility Particle Sizer, or FMPS, to measure the size distribution by number of particles ranging from 5.6 nanometers up to about 560 nanometers. We used a handheld optical particle counter to measure larger particles, those ranging from about 0.3 micrometers or 300 nanometers up to about 10 micrometers in diameter. A nanoparticle aerosol monitor measured surface area concentrations of particles ranging from about 10 nanometers up to about 1,000 nanometers or 1 micrometer in diameter. We used a dust tract photometer with a PM2.5 inlet to measure mass concentrations of particles ranging from about 100 nanometers or 0.1 micrometer up to 2.5 micrometers in diameter. A Moody Cascade impactor was used to sample particles onto substrates that were subsequently observed in a scanning electron microscope, or SEM, to determine their morphology. As I mentioned previously, the Q-Track was used to measure temperature and relative humidity inside the granulator enclosure. <laughs>
Here is an image of our test apparatus. You can see my co-author, Jeff Spangenberger, who is feeding test plaques every 15 seconds into the granulator inside the enclosure. You can tell that the chamber is at negative pressure relative to the room because the gloves stick straight out into the chamber due to the pressure difference. Leading away from the chamber, you can see our sampling duct and some of the instruments that are sampling air from the duct. In this image, you can see the enclosure and duct from the opposite side and some more of our instruments, including the FMPS, the booty impactor, the dust track, and others. Moving on to some results, I'm going to present a set of three figures on each slide showing particle concentration versus time taken with a single instrument for each type of plastic. At the top will be the plain polypropylene test plaques, in the middle will be the conventional talc-filled polypropylene composite test plaques, and at the bottom will be the nanoclay-filled polypropylene nanocomposite test plaques. The figures are color-coded. The orange data represent the particle concentrations in the room during a period when the enclosure door was open and we pulled room air directly into the apparatus using the fan unit. The blue data are background concentrations after we shut the enclosure door and air entered the apparatus through the HEPA filter. The green data are the background concentrations when the enclosure door was shut and the granulator was turned on with no test plaques being shredded. We will primarily look at the red data which were taken over two hours when the test plaques were being shredded. So on this slide, we are looking at the particle number concentrations measured over time using the P-Track. The plain resin plaques exhibited the highest particle concentrations among the three types of plastic during the shredding period, averaging about 15,000 particles per cubic centimeter. Although concentrations bounced up and down over short intervals, the average was steady throughout the shredding period. The concentrations measured when the conventional talc-filled resin plaques were shredded were much lower, just above background concentrations and considerably lower than room concentrations. The number of concentrations when the nanocomposite plaques were shredded were approximately 5,000 particles per cubic centimeter, higher than the talc-filled resin plaques, but lower than the plain resin plaques. Particle number concentrations were calculated from the fast mobility particle sizer data by summing the particle levels measured in each size interval. We found higher concentrations from the FMPS than from the P-Track. Because the FMPS measures particles with diameters down to 5.6 nanometers, whereas the P-Track only measures particles down to about 20 nanometers, the higher levels seen in the FMPS data indicate that many particles smaller than 20 nanometers were generated when the test plaques were shredded. Comparisons of concentrations measured using the FMPS for the three types of plastics show the same ordering as we found with the P-Track, with the plain polypropylene resin having the highest concentrations, followed by the nanocomposite, and then the conventional talc-filled plastic. Looking at surface area concentrations, we observe the same relationship among the different kinds of plastics, with the plain resin exhibiting the highest concentrations, the conventional plastic having the lowest, and the nanocomposite plastic being in between. You can see here, and on the two previous slides, that many of the concentrations we measured when test plaques were being shredded were of the same magnitude, or maybe even lower in some cases, than the particle levels in the room. When we look at the dust track data during the shredding periods, we can see that the mass concentrations measured were essentially the same as the background mass concentrations for all three test materials, except at the very beginning of the measurements with the plain resin, which was the first resin we tested, when we saw a spike in concentration at the very beginning of the shredding period. This spike is probably due to the granulator having some large particles from a previous study attached to its blades that did not come off until we started shredding our test plaques. We can see that concentrations fall back down to background levels very quickly following the spike. Overall, the mass concentration data suggests that few large particles were generated during shredding because they would be the ones that would contribute to an increase in mass concentrations. This table shows the mean concentrations measured for each type of resin with the four instruments we've already looked at as well as for the AeroTrack 9306 optical particle counter, which looked at number concentrations for larger particles. 
You can see for the P-Track and the FMPS the same results that we saw in the figures where the plain resin produced higher concentrations than the nanocomposite material, and the nanocomposite material had higher particle concentrations than the talc-filled resin. The same pattern is observed for the surface area concentrations. For particles 300 nanometers in diameter and larger, the AeroTrack 9306 data show that number concentrations were very low. This is consistent with the dust track observations where we saw that mass concentrations during shredding were close to the background levels when the granulator was turned off. How do the particle number concentrations observed in our test compare with real-world particle levels seen in other research studies? In 2004, Coolbush et al. looked at carbon black production and found concentrations greater than 100,000 particles per cubic centimeter, which is higher than any levels that we were able to observe. My colleague Tom Peters from the University of Iowa and his co-authors studied an engine machining and assembly plant and they observed between 140,000 and 830,000 particles per cubic centimeter, most of which were attributable to direct fired heating for the facility. Macaulay et al., looking at a beryllium metal and alloys plant, measured particle number concentrations greater than 1 billion particles per cubic centimeter, an exceedingly high level, at one location within that plant. In our study, the maximum concentration observed with the plain resin using the FMPS was 62,000 particles per cubic centimeter, which was lower than any of the maximum concentrations from the other papers. In a real workplace where plastics are being shredded by a larger machine at a faster pace, we anticipate that concentrations might be about 10 times higher than in this experimental study. Even with this adjustment, number concentrations produced by shredding of plastics would not be out of line with what has been observed in other operations that may generate airborne nanoparticles. This figure shows the frequency distribution measured by the fast mobility particle sizer for each of the test resins on the vertical axis as a function of particle diameter on the horizontal axis. As we saw in the concentration measurement results previously, the plain resin in black exhibited the highest frequency distribution followed by the nanocomposite resin in blue and then the talc-filled conventional resin in orange. In particular, the highest points in the distributions are for particles about 10 nanometers in diameter and smaller. There are smaller peaks at around 20 nanometers for the plain resin and the nanocomposite material, but not for the talc-filled resin. This is important because the smallest dimension expected from the nanoclay composite material is about 30 nanometers, so we did not expect to observe particles 10 nanometers or even 20 nanometers in size. Because these particles are so small, and because they are present when each of the three resins are shredded, it's difficult to see how they could be derived from nanomaterials. Scanning electron microscope images of samples collected using the Moody impactor show that similar particles were captured from each of the three plastics as they were shredded. Individual spherical particles may be a result of volatilization of the polymer as it is heated by shredding, followed by immediate recondensation in the surrounding air. We also see chain agglomerates of spheres, as well as compact and more spread out aggregates of smaller particles. For the nanocomposite, the smallest particles we could observe using the scanning electron microscope were those in these images, which were about 23 to 26 nanometers in diameter. On the left is a view of the particles using secondary electron imaging. The particles are easily distinguished from the background substrate. When we look at the same particles using backscatter electron imaging, we would expect the particles to stand out brightly from the polycarbonate substrate if they contained elements like silicon, magnesium, calcium, and aluminum present in the nanoclay. However, they blend into the background, indicating that they are probably composed of the resin itself. To summarize, our findings indicate that the particle concentrations we measured were typical of the levels of particles found in many industrial settings. The lowest particle concentrations we measured were when the conventional talc-filled polypropylene resin plaques were shredded. We observe fewer nanoparticles being generated from the nanocomposite test plaques than when the plain polypropylene resin plaques were shredded. For all three materials, the count median diameters of the particles generated during shredding were about 10 nanometers in diameter. 
Scanning electron microscopy images suggest that the nanoclay was not liberated from the nanocomposite plastic. Instead, most of the nanoparticles appear to be formed from the polypropylene resin itself, perhaps by condensation of polymer vapors produced by heat when the test plaques were shredded. This hypothesis for particle formation requires further investigation. In conclusion, our measurements suggest that the recycling of nanoclay reinforced plastics does not have a strong potential to generate more nanoparticles into the air than recycling of conventional plastics. It also does not have a strong potential to generate unique airborne nanoparticles composed of the composite engineered nanomaterial. Our study is just one example of the type of research that has been done in an attempt to characterize the amount of risk that workers and consumers face when they work with ENM enabled products. Through the rest of the module, we will talk about several nanomaterial enabled products that present risks of exposures for workers and also consumers. We'll start by talking some more about nanocomposites, only this time we'll talk about their machining, including processes such as cutting or sawing, sanding, and drilling. In addition, we'll consider how aging and weathering may influence the release of engineered nanomaterials from nanocomposites. Next, we'll discuss the sanding of nanocoatings like paints or finishes. We'll briefly consider the potential for worker exposures to nanomedicines. Then we'll talk a little about consumer products and how users may be exposed to nanomaterials incorporated into them. I'd like to talk more in depth about recycling of ENM enabled nanoproducts, but the study we've already reviewed is the only one at this time that has looked specifically at the potential for releases of nanomaterials during recycling. More research is certainly needed on this topic. This schematic diagram from a paper by Timothy Duncan illustrates the potential pathways by which engineered nanomaterials can be released from nanocomposites into workplaces or the natural environment. Changes by chemical or mechanical processes must alter the nanocomposite before nanomaterials, depicted as little spheres in this figure, can be released. The vertical axis shows increasing chemical changes that lead to decomposition of the nanocomposite while the horizontal axis shows increasing mechanical energy input that leads to degradation of the nanocomposite. Worker or consumer tasks like sanding, cutting, and drilling may be necessary, but they degrade the nanocomposite, potentially leading to the release of nanoparticles. These are purely mechanical processes. Photodecomposition by ultraviolet radiation, intentional and unintentional thermal processes, and exposure to water over time may lead to chemical changes in the nanocomposite that release nanoparticles. Intentional and unintentional mechanical energy, machining, agitation, winds, applied to nanocomposites that have already experienced some level of chemical decomposition has the greatest potential to release free nanoparticles. High energy thermal decomposition such as fires have the potential to alter the polymers so that the nanomaterials are able to be released. We will focus most on the machining processes, but also consider the combination of chemical decomposition and machining. Let's look at data from several published research studies. Sexy and co-authors investigated particle generation as holes were drilled into a nanocomposite material. This figure shows particle number concentrations measured with a direct reading instrument as a function of time while a plain polyamide 6 resin was drilled into continuously for 14 minutes. Particle concentrations rose to a peak of about 80,000 particles per cubic centimeter before they declined after the drilling ended. The dashed line barely visible at the very bottom of the figure represents particles generated in the background as the drill was operated without drilling into the resin. Next, the researchers conducted the same experiment with polyamide 6 containing 5% by weight montmorillonite nanoclay as the filler to strengthen the plastic. This time, particle concentrations rose to a peak of only about 3,500 particles per cubic centimeter. The substantially lower concentrations observed when machining the nanocomposite relative to the plain resin is similar to the lower concentrations observed during their shredding of the nanocomposite plastic relative to plain resin in the recycling study I presented earlier. The authors of this study observed particles collected from air samples as well as particles that settled to the floor using a scanning electron microscope. 
Airborne particles observed from drilling the plane resin were primarily agglomerates of smaller particles. However, no agglomerates were observed from samples collected as the researchers drilled into the polyam and six montmorillonite nanocomposite. Some of these particles are in the nanoscale range, but the authors do not indicate the composition of the particles, so we're not sure if they are polymer, nanoclay, or a mix of the two. Settled particles were similar agglomerates of smaller particles for both plastics. While drilling of the nanocomposite in this study generated airborne particles, it is not clear that any of them were free nanoclay particles. Bello and co-authors were able to observe the dry cutting with a bandsaw of carbon and alumina composite materials created with and without carbon nanotubes as reinforcing agents. The figure shows particle size distributions with particle number concentrations on the vertical axis and particle diameter on the horizontal axis. For particles a few hundred nanometers in diameter and smaller, sampled near the operator's nose and mouth, collectively referred to as the breathing zone. When the materials were cut, the composites containing carbon nanotubes generated the same or lower concentrations of nanoscale particles than those without the nanotubes. Both the carbon and the aluminum nanocomposites produced fewer nanoscale particles with nanotubes. In this case, cutting of the nanomaterials does not appear to present an elevated exposure risk for workers. Sanding is a process specifically intended to remove and release small quantities of a material. Huang and co-authors investigated the sanding of nanocomposite test sticks made from epoxy resin filled with multi-walled carbon nanotubes. With test sticks made from 2% nanotubes by weight, they found that increasing the rotational speed of the sanding disk produced greater particle number concentrations and respirable mass concentrations. This is not surprising since we expect greater energy input to generate more particles. Transmission electron microscope images of particles sampled from the air during sanding in this study show that many spherical particles on the order of 50 nanometers in diameter were present in the air. These particles are likely derived from thermal decomposition of the epoxy resin. The image on the right also shows a much larger particle of the nanocomposite with a carbon nanotube protruding from the side. These transmission electron microscope images of a particle from the same paper show this phenomenon again, a carbon nanotube protruding from a larger particle of the nanocomposite material. The carbon nanotube has not been released as an individual nanoparticle, but if nanotubes can protrude so prominently from a larger particle, the risk exists for at least a few of them to emerge from the composite material. As Huang and co-authors increased the amount of carbon nanotubes in the epoxy from 0% to 4% by weight, they found that sanding of the 4% composite produced the highest particle number and respirable mass concentrations among the various percentages. They attribute this finding to the high weight percent of nanotubes forming a nanocomposite that is more brittle than the nanocomposites with lower nanotube percentages, making it easier for sanding to break the nanocomposite into small particles. For almost all test conditions, Guang and co-authors were unable to find free carbon nanotubes. They only found a few particles with nanotubes protruding from the surface. However, when they took scanning electron microscope images of particles sampled from the air as they sanded the brittle nanocomposite containing 4% carbon nanotubes by weight, they were able to see particles that appear to be nanotubes separated from the nanocomposite. This suggests that specific composition of a nanocomposite is an important determinant of the risk of nanomaterial release. Another research team has also shown the potential for release of free nanotubes. Schlagenhoff and co-authors set up a test apparatus where a wheel abraded an epoxy carbon nanotube composite plastic inside a small enclosure. The air inside the chamber was sampled near the abrasion wheel. Transmission electron microscope images of particles sampled from the air included agglomerated particles of epoxy resin, agglomerated particles with protruding carbon nanotubes like those observed by Wong et al., freestanding individual nanotubes, and agglomerated particles that appear to be laying on top of freestanding individual nanotubes.
The research studies conducted by Huang and co-authors and Schlegenhoff and co-authors clearly indicate that sanding and abrading a nanocomposite with carbon nanotubes as the filler poses a risk of worker exposure to free individual nanotubes. Methner and co-authors studied the potential for machining of an epoxy carbon nanofiber nanocomposite to release individual nanofibers into the air. As shown in the images, the researchers were able to find individual nanofibers of various diameters in samples taken during wet saw cutting, during surface grinding, during belt sanding, and during hand sanding. This indicates that exposures to carbon nanofibers from nanocomposites are possible when the nanocomposites are machined. As we saw in the schematic diagram earlier, the aging and weathering of nanocomposites has the potential to cause chemical decomposition of the material. This possibility can be investigated by artificial weathering of test materials using high doses of ultraviolet radiation. Wolleben and co-authors investigated the impacts of weathering by exposing plain polyoxymethylene, or PON, resin and PON containing carbon nanotubes as filler to elevated levels of ultraviolet equivalent to nine months of outdoor exposure. This is a worst case scenario because polyoxymethylene is susceptible to change when exposed to visible light or ultraviolet radiation. As shown in the top view and cross section images, the surface of the nanocomposite is damaged more by the artificial weathering than the surface of the plain resin, suggesting that the presence of the carbon nanotubes makes the aging process more rapid. The chemical analyses of exposed surfaces in the chart illustrate that the plain POM resin and the POM plus nanotube nanocomposite before artificial weathering have surfaces composed primarily of the polymer. However, the nanocomposite after artificial weathering shows a predominance of nanotubes as evidenced by the presence of significant levels of boron and iron, which serve as markers for carbon nanotubes because they are used during synthesis of the nanotubes to achieve particular properties. The presence of such a large amount of nanotubes emerging from the nanocomposite matrix suggests that handling and agitation of the weathered nanocomposite or any machining performed on the weathered material might pose an enhanced risk of releasing individual carbon nanotubes into the air. Hearth and co-authors demonstrated this potential for nanomaterial release by agitating the surface of an artificially weathered nanocomposite of thermoplastic polyurethane containing carbon nanotubes as the fill material. Transmission electron microscope images of air samples taken during the ultrasonic agitation show that freestanding individual carbon nanotubes were released from the artificially weathered nanocomposite. Let's summarize what we've discussed regarding the potential for exposures to engineered nanomaterials from the machining of nanocomposites. Many studies show that machining of nanocomposites produces particles that can reach all parts of the human respiratory system. Greater energy inputs generally produce higher concentrations of particles. The question, of course, is whether or not any of these particles are free, individual, engineered nanomaterials. The research suggests that most particles produced by machining of nanocomposites, the vast majority even, are either small pieces of the entire nanocomposite or just the resin itself without the engineered nanomaterial. However, the machining of nanocomposites made with carbon nanotubes or carbon nanofibers has the potential to release these nanomaterials with sufficient energy input. Aging and weathering are likely to increase the risk of the release of individual nanomaterials from nanocomposites. Like nanocomposites, surfaces with nanocoatings are sometimes abraded, either intentionally or through natural processes. Chandelia and co-authors assess the potential for generation of nanoparticles from the abrasion of surfaces covered with nanotitanium dioxide photocatalytic nanocoatings. Abrasion was provided using a standard testing apparatus. Nanocoating number one was made from nanotitanium dioxide particles smaller than eight nanometers while nanocoating number two was comprised of nanoparticles smaller than 40 nanometers. The figure on the left shows the number concentration of particles generated as a function of time for both nanocoatings 
as well as the uncoated substrate. Nano coating number two produced the same particle concentrations as the plain substrate, suggesting that it provided no resistance to abrasion so that the underlying substrate was almost immediately exposed. Abrasion of nano coating number one resulted in much lower concentrations until the end of the test period when the coating was completely removed, leaving only the substrate. On the right, size distributions by number for the airborne particles, showing number concentration as a function of diameter, demonstrate that virtually no particles the size of the primary nanoparticles, smaller than 8 or 40 nanometers, were observed. The authors imaged particles that were sampled from the air during their tests. Examples are shown of a particle sampled from nanocoating number one on the left and one from nanocoating number two on the right. Particles observed from both nanocoatings were primarily agglomerates of smaller particles and were comprised of either the nanocoating or the substrate underneath. No free individual titanium dioxide nanoparticles were seen. Using a test apparatus that simulated sanding of coatings, Gohler and co-authors counted the number of particles released by the sanding of polyurethane coatings with and without nano-zinc oxide and white architectural coatings, or paints, with and without both nano-zinc oxide and nano-iron oxide. In all cases, both with and without the nanoparticles in the coatings, more than half of the observed particles were smaller than 100 nanometers. In addition, the presence of engineered nanomaterials did not make a statistically significant difference in the number of particles released. Images of particles sampled by Gohler et al. from the air near the sanding process demonstrate that the particles released when the nanocoatings were sanded were ones with the nanoparticles embedded in the carrier materials. For example, this transmission electron microscope image of a particle generated from the sanding of the polyurethane coating that contained nano-zinc oxide clearly shows the dark nanoparticles within the lighter polyurethane. Golanski and co-authors report results of energetic abrasion tests on surfaces coated with paint containing nanosilicon dioxide. As shown in the transmission electron microscope image on the left, these authors were able to observe particles 20 nanometers in size and smaller. On the right, the output from the analysis of one of these nanoparticles by energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy shows distinct peaks of silicon and oxygen. This indicates that these abrasion tests are able to cause the release of free nanoparticles. To briefly summarize these studies on the abrasion of nanocoatings, it's clear that standard abrasion tests and simulated sanding tests generate particles from nanocoatings. In most of the cases, the released particles are relatively large with the engineered nanomaterials embedded in the carrier material. If tests are sufficiently energetic, however, it is possible to observe the release of free individual nanoparticles into the air. These releases could present an exposure risk for workers or consumers who use these coating products. Nanomedicine is a field that offers the potential for enormous societal benefits. This brochure from associate's degree in nursing.org describes some of the features of nanomedicine. As indicated in the brochure, nanomedicine refers to highly specific medical interventions at the molecular level for curing disease or repairing damaged tissue. Nanomedicine works by injecting nanoparticles into a patient's body to deliver medicine, find and treat disease, or repair damaged cells. It offers possibilities of faster diagnoses of many ailments, more precise treatments of many conditions such as cancer, repairing tissue deep inside the body, and targeting only diseased organs without destroying healthy tissue. Examples of nanomedicine applications include delivery of diabetes medicines, using a patient's own microRNA from their blood to diagnose and rapidly treat cancer, targeted thermal treatments of cancer cells to destroy them, and rapid and more accurate testing for influenza. Among the engineered nanomaterials in use or being studied for use in nanomedicine are metallic particles like iron oxide, silver nanoparticles, gold shell nanoparticles, fullerenes, carbon nanotubes, quantum dots, dendromers, which are highly branched macromolecules with nanometer scale dimensions, lipid-based nanoparticles, 
which include triglycerides, diglycerides, monoglycerides, fatty acids, and steroids, ceramic nanoparticles, nanotubes made from materials aside from carbon, nanowires, and magnetic nanoparticles usually made from iron, nickel, or cobalt. According to the European Agency for Safety and Health at Work, workers with potential exposures to nanomaterials in medicine include pharmacy personnel, clinicians such as nurses, physicians, and respiratory therapists, environmental services personnel such as those who clean rooms and collect solid waste, and shipping and receiving personnel. According to Murashov, the tasks these workers perform that might create exposures to nanomaterials in medical applications include drug preparation and transport, drug administration, drug disposal, handling of patient excreta, meaning urine and feces, spill response, handling of contaminated items, consuming food or beverages that have contacted drugs, and cleaning and maintenance. It's important to note that many of these tasks are likely to lead to dermal or even ingestion exposures rather than inhalation exposures. Worker exposures to nanomaterials in medicine have not been well characterized in research studies at this point. However, potential exposures should be anticipated, recognized, evaluated, and controlled in order to reduce risk. While we focus most in this series of modules on worker exposures to engineered nanomaterials, consumers may also potentially be exposed to nanomaterials as they use products. Vance and co-authors summarized a database of available nanomaterial-enabled consumer products collected through 2014. The single largest block of products that they identified was in the area of health and fitness, which includes personal care products, clothing, cosmetics and sunscreens, and sporting goods. There are a substantial number of home and garden and automotive products as well. Other categories include electronics, food and beverages, appliances, goods for children, as well as cross-cutting products. For nanomaterial-enabled consumer products in which the nanomaterial constituents have been identified, the majority contain metal nanomaterials, especially silver nanoparticles. A substantial number of products contain carbon, carbon nanotubes, fullerenes, or graphene. A significant number of products containing nanoscale silicon are also on the market. Consumer products are most likely to contain surface-bound nanomaterials or nanomaterials suspended in liquids. Notably, many of the carbon-based engineered nanomaterials are suspended in solids, likely in nanocomposite plastics in most cases. Engineered nanomaterial-enabled products that have potential to expose consumers to nanomaterials include sunscreens and cosmetics that may lead to dermal exposures, food containers that may leach nanomaterials into food or beverages, cleaners that may produce dermal or possibly inhalation exposures, and clothing and bedding that may release nanoparticles onto skin or through the air. How about ingestion exposures to children who may put stuffed animals containing silver nanoparticles in their mouths? Nanoproducts that are much less likely to expose users to engineered nanomaterials include electronic products, and sporting goods like bicycles and tennis rackets. It should also be noted that nanocomposites and materials with nanocoatings may also be drilled, sawed, or sanded by consumers and not just workers. Let's look at examples of a couple of products that may release nanoparticles to which consumers could be exposed. First, Golansky and co-authors used a tool to harshly agitate a polyvinyl chloride fabric coated with unidentified nanoparticles. The figure shows the size distribution of particles released from the fabric, plotted as number concentration on the vertical axis versus particle diameter on the horizontal axis. The researchers were able to detach individual nanoparticles, as illustrated by the red curve. Almost all of the detached nanoparticles were smaller than 50 nanometers, with the largest mode at 16 nanometers. No substantial concentrations of nanoparticles were observed with a plain polyvinyl chloride fabric, shown by the green curve. These data indicate that the release of nanoparticles from fabrics is possible, at least with severe agitation of the fabric. 
Another potential consumer exposure to nanoparticles comes from the use of nano-zinc oxide in sunscreens. In 2012, the European Commission Scientific Committee on Consumer Safety evaluated the risks from these exposures. The committee found no evidence that zinc oxide nanoparticles are able to be absorbed through intact skin. They also indicated that even if the nanoparticles were absorbed through the skin, continuous dissolution of zinc ions would lead to complete solubilization of particles within the body. The authors found evidence that a small proportion of zinc may be solubilized from the nanoparticles and be absorbed through the skin. However, the absorbed zinc is likely to be insignificant compared to the amount of zinc already present in a human body. The committee also concluded that because zinc oxide nanoparticles can cause lung inflammation if inhaled, any sunscreen sprays containing zinc oxide nanoparticles cannot be considered safe. Novak and co-authors evaluated and summarized the likelihood of releases of carbon nanotubes from nanomaterial-enabled products in a number of different scenarios. While these scenarios are for nanotubes, similar reasoning applies for other kinds of engineered nanomaterials. The authors indicate that, although worker exposures to carbon nanotubes during the manufacture of nanotube-containing products via injection molding are unlikely, worker exposures during cutting, sawing, drilling, and sanding of nanocomposites are very likely. Consumer exposures to nanomaterials and the release of nanomaterials to the natural environment are considered likely for nanotubes utilized in tires and fabrics. Releases to the environment are considered unlikely by other scenarios, including incineration and landfilling of nanomaterial-enabled products that have reached the end of their useful lives. The authors assert that recycling of any nanomaterial-enabled products poses a risk of recycling worker exposures and releases to the natural environment. Clearly, there are multiple ways in which workers and consumers can potentially be exposed to engineered nanomaterials released from ENM-enabled products. We'll end by summarizing the main points from the module. Cutting, sawing, drilling into, and recycling of nanocomposites, as well as the sanding of nanocoatings, can produce airborne nanoparticles. However, little evidence exists for the generation of individual engineered nanoparticles except under relatively extreme and energetic conditions. Carbon nanotubes may have the greatest potential for being released as individual nanoparticles, although this may be a biased finding because products containing carbon nanotubes have been studied more extensively than others. Weathering and aging of products containing nanomaterials is likely to increase the potential for release of engineered nanoparticles. Finally, the risks of worker exposure in nanomedicine are uncertain, but they should nonetheless be anticipated and managed. This lesson has been created by the Midwest Emerging Technologies Public Health and Safety Training, or METFAST, program, a collaboration of the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, the University of Iowa College of Public Health, and Dakota County Technical College. Funding for the METFAST program is provided by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. The content of this lesson is solely the responsibility of the developers, does not necessarily represent the official views of the National Institutes of Health. Thank you very much for joining me.